Hey guys, my name's Albert, and welcome to our Lead the Charge video series. Join me as I chat to industry experts within the EV sector as we cover topics such as fleet, carbon footprint, and charging. Now sit back, relax, and hopefully by the end of this video, you'll have learned at least one thing that you can take away. Really appreciate you joining us, Tim. No worries. No. If you could just really just give us a, an overview of what you do, your background, um, how you became involved with the world of EVs and, and electric vehicles, and uh, yeah, just give us a bit of an overview. Yeah, no worries. I'll try and keep it short. Um, so I've been or have been in the motor trade for nearly 20 years. Uh, there was a couple of spells where I was in sales and marketing in different trades. Uh, but my, my last job for eight years was, in fact, a used car buyer for Vindus Group. So I did used to frequent on the Aston Barclay site. And um, during uh, just before COVID, our fleet uh, manager over at Vindis, Colin Hutton, he uh, he had a talk with us all about EVs and the exciting opportunities that there were <clears throat> in this new industry. And it really kind of uh, encouraged me to get more into EVs. And then soon after that, COVID happened. A lot of us were at home, um, unfortunately, at that period, because we weren't essential workers. And I come up with this idea of charge heads, which was essentially to try and encourage more uh, car enthusiasts to get into electric cars uh, with modified EVs and EV conversions. And this started to get me thinking around EVs, started to build my knowledge. And then last year in uh, February, I left Vindus Group and I started with Vital EV. And Vital EV are a full turnkey DC and AC solutions provider. We work with all manner of companies, whether it's OEMs, CPOs, so charge point operators, councils, um, local businesses, dealers, auction houses. So anyone you can think of, we help with their solutions essentially. So that's 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 what kind of got me in uh, into the EV world. Uh, where I am now, but I continue with charge heads. So I'm always out there meeting people in the industry and I absolutely love it. Like, like yourself, Albert, because, you know, we, we've met uh, in the EV circles. I absolutely love everything to do with EV. It's exciting, you know, yeah. especially power. I'm a massive car nut, you know, massive petrol head as before. And, um, and yeah, basically I've just started in this uh, new EV world and yeah, just want to see where it goes. It's a little bit contagious, the EV world, isn't it? So you mentioned Aston Barkley that you used to buy from us. So this is a, a burning question. How many did you actually purchase? No, I'm kidding. I'm joking. <laughs> um, so just, <laughs> just move on that. Um, so are there any like specific projects um, that you're currently undertaking uh, within, within, um, within your role? Anything exciting that you're doing that you, you want to share with us? Anything that's kind of like, anything that's kind of like your, your, your main drive, your main passion within that space? There are quite a few NDAs in place, but if I keep it fairly generic, so um, I did do a lot of works with events last year. Um, so we worked at Carfest where we did something very exciting. We had um, three of our movable DC chargers that we sell a lot of. Um, they're Kempower, which is the brand that Vital EV started with in 2019. Um, so we had these three chargers at Carfest plumbed into to 150 kilowatt hour battery packs. So essentially charging cars in a green way because these battery packs were filled with electricity from renewable sources. Um, because awesome. quite a lot, with a lot of events, they do tend to be, unfortunately at the moment, until the power uh, network is uh, improved, uh, get powered off HVO generators or diesel generators, which isn't ideal. However, it is going towards the greater good in terms of, an electric, uh, you know, electric transport. Um, but at the moment, what I'm doing this year, Albert, is I'm really focusing on uh, commercial dealers. And that's not just car dealers, that's also truck dealers, van dealers. Because of my yeah. background, that kind of suits me. And that is a massive, um, you know, a massive market at the moment. Uh, because of what's happening with all of the emissions that uh, the government's bringing in. And we need to make sure that you know, all these dealers have got big targets to hit. 
So we want to make sure that the charging infrastructure for them and their customers is there to help them do that. You know, those those movable chargers that you spoke about, I mean, I, I can see how that would that would be such a massive benefit to so many companies. I mean, just working, I used to work at Tesla before I was here and I can just see how we would have benefited as a business and service centers having those movable chargers. But I mean, I could talk about that kind of stuff all day. It's super, super, super exciting. Um, so just quickly on that, when it comes to like yourself personally, do you own an EV like, currently? What's your experience with an EV? When I started the EV uh, YouTube channel, which is Charge Heads, I didn't actually own an EV. Um, however, I do and have owned an EV for nearly two years now, which is a Tesla Model 3 long range, uh, 69 plate. Um, I bought it, it was the cheapest on Auto Trader at the time. It was, I think it was 36,000 pounds nice. with 56,000 miles on it. Um, prices went up with the bubble, prices came down. Obviously they're, keep, they're going down a lot more now. Um, it's now done 92,000 miles. Uh, it's got full self drive on it, I absolutely love it. Um, I have mildly yeah. modified it because I'm a bit of a car nut, as I said, and it, it, it kind of uh, contributes to the YouTube channel, what I'm trying to achieve there. And as you might know, Albert, I, for the last nearly probably over two years, have been building an electric TVR with the help of Ralph, Ralph Hosier at RHEL Engineering Limited with a Tesla motor. So, yeah, soon, should That's be in a few months' yeah. time, I should have a Tesla powered TVR, which is uh, going to be very exciting. And you'll be able to show it to us. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's see you know, what that looks like. Uh, that sounds incredible. Yeah, it's going to be, in terms of the spec, the reason why it's taken so long, because I've I've gone down the route of creating it with Ralph um, with used parts where possible. So used batteries from an MG ZS, yep. uh, used Tesla motor, small drive unit, and a few other used items as well, just to keep it as green as possible. Um, having created probably, you know, TDRs are really exciting cars. I'm a massive petrol head at heart and I wanted to create something that was even more exciting. So watch this space with yeah, that. Amazing. Check out the channel for the vlog. So yeah, just on to our, our next question. So from your perspective, like what's the most significant trends that you're observing right now within the EV space? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what I've noticed at the moment is a lot of the bigger companies out there are, it's, it's a bit of a, a bit of a power grab at the moment, as you might, uh, as a lot of people might know, and a lot of people get to know is if anybody wants a rapid fast charger on site, and we at Vital EV where I work, we specialize in DC charging. So it tends to be sort of 40 kilowatts up to 400 kilowatts, because we've actually got the fastest DC charger in the whole of the UK, which is at Milbrook Proving Ground, which is, you know, very swift charger, 800 volts. And at the moment, it's the main kind of uh, blocker at the moment is the power. So, for example, if you've got a business <clears throat> and they want a 100 or 200 kilowatt charger on site, uh, for example, and they need to speak to their DNO, which is their electric provider, they might not actually have the power there straight away. And what uh, with, with that, you need to think about the cost of upgrading the power. And also it does take some time to actually get that power from the DNO. So this sometimes can be can slow, slow down the process of being able to have that higher power. So at the moment, what I see is a lot of the charge point operators, a lot of the big companies, it's a bit of a power grab, trying to get the power where there's places with power, making sure that they are putting charges in there or they're uh, purchased in the land. That's that's what I see at the moment. And what the the grid, uh, what the national grid have recommended is trying to look in the future with regards to your potential electric needs. And I think a lot of people are only looking to the next five years, but I think we really need to start looking at maybe beyond that to what your future needs will be and asking your DNO for that type, that kind of power um, to make sure that you have, you don't have to do it all over again and incur more costs. But obviously it does mean that there is a financial, uh, quite a large financial cost to get to that point. So that that's what I've seen at the moment, a power, uh, a, a real power grab really at the moment.
So the next question would be, how do you foresee the adoption and innovation of EVs uh, evolving in the next few years? Okay, so at the moment, you know, there are so many different brands coming in, uh, you know, going from ICE, internal combustion engines, to EV. Uh, Alfa Romeo, they've got a new electric SUV coming. There are all these brands that are getting into electric now. Chinese brands are, are starting to hit the market as well. BYD, they've got yep. three uh, models in the market. Uh, so the Seal, the Dolphin and the Atos 3. We've got MG, who's been doing yep. really well with the MG4. But there's other brands that are coming as well. Um, so there's, I think there's going to be a wash of more Chinese cars coming into the market. I don't think that they're cheap enough to make as much of a difference, but I think that will come down. We've also got the voltage difference coming in. So cars like the Taycan, Porsche Taycan, the Audi RS e-tron GT, uh, some of the Hyundai and Kias, they've got a higher voltage uh, uh, DNA. So basically... Uh, they run off a higher voltage battery, which means charging, they can charge quicker. Um, and there's lots of other benefits to the higher voltage uh, setup and uh, infrastructure of the vehicle, so to speak. Um, and I think that will progress as well. So I think more and more EVs will go towards a higher voltage um, DNA. Um, ultimately, it, it depends on how many years you want to look ahead, because the way that I see things going, and this has been um, this has been uh, kind of uh, suggested by a lot of experts, is the fact in maybe ten years' time, when full self driving is gonna is certainly gonna happen at some point, and more so as time goes on, especially in cities, that soon we'll have a type of Uber service where you won't actually own a vehicle unless you're a you know hardcore enthusiast like myself, or maybe like yourself, Albert. But, you know, you'll get your phone out, you'll press the app and it'll be like an Uber. You press the button, uh, an electric car um, will turn up at your house, you jump in it, it'll take you to where you want to go and it'll go away again. And that's super exciting, think, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, if you think about the amount of space and the amount of materials that used to produce all these cars that we have and how much they're actually used, outside my window, there are three cars and they're just sat there doing nothing. If you think about, you know, efficiency and efficient use of materials and power, it'd be better to have less cars and being used more of the time. So that, what a lot of experts are saying is that that's what's going to be the future um, of electric transport. And of course, you know, getting on the electric scooters and stuff like that for the uh, smaller trips, of course. I've got an electric scooter myself. And, you know, that will radically change, not the electric scooter, but that, that will radically change the congestion within cities, like having that sort of, you know, that that sort of um, thing thing in place. So, yeah, yeah it's huge, uh, massively huge. And, you know, one thing you, one thing you mentioned about the, the, the voltage of the batteries, you know, I have these conversations with people all the time saying, you know, well, I've got 100 kilowatt hour battery in this car and 100 kilowatt hour battery in this car. And, you know, one's charging much quicker than the other. And it's, you know, I feel like the education around electric vehicles just it really isn't where it needs to be for people to fully understand that just because you've both got the same size battery in your car doesn't mean mm. that these cars are going to charge at the same rate. They're not going to be the same yeah. speeds. They're not going to be, you know, especially around charging. There's so much, you know, e even which we'll come on to in a moment in, in another question regarding around AC and DC. Like people just don't know what that is. People no. just don't know what it means to pull up to a, an AC charger or a DC charger, you know, yeah. to have a 22 kilowatt AC or 22 kilowatt DC and um, which we'll go into in just a second. But, what just on the back of what you said in terms of you know a lot of cars just sitting there or people not knowing about the voltage of batteries you know what do you think is the biggest challenge that the ev industry is facing at the moment in terms of moving forward and and progressing quicker than we are and getting more people into those vehicles and and, uh, and all that kind of stuff um so i've already uh, mentioned about the rapid charging making sure we've got enough power in the locations that you want the rapid charging that is part of it. But the biggest thing for me, which I think is going to massively open up EV adoption, is AC charging, home charging for people without driveways. That is the biggest thing. Now, I'm lucky, and I don't know about yourself, Albert, but I'm lucky because I've got a driveway and I've got AC charging, which means I can charge my vehicle overnight at a cheaper rate. I'm on a particular tariff. I won't advertise their name. And it's 9.5p per kilowatt hour. So it cost me like seven quid, not even that, to fill up the Tesla that will do between 250 in the winter and 300 miles in the summer. 
you know, mixed driving. And you know what, Tim, that's, that's crazy for me that, that we say that because we, I go around and I tell people these same stories. It, it, it would charge, cost me nine pounds to fill my car, 10 pounds to fill my car. Mm. And then the person who doesn't have to drive, they're like, I just paid 40 pounds to fill up my car. You know, so there's a massive difference in, in pricing. I think, you know, that that's, you're right. I think that's massively, massively going to change, um, you know, the, the future of, of EVs. And it's a massive challenge right now. And I think that once that changes, because when you're in a petrol diesel car, you know how much you're going to pay no matter where you are in the country, roughly yeah. to fill up your car. Yeah. When you're in, a, in an EV, my frustration is, is that, and you know, I didn't realize this until I was quite spoiled. I had a, I've, I've only had a Tesla up until I've, I've gone into my Audi, still have my Tesla, love it, got a very similar car to you. I didn't realize how the prices changed so much and how, how easy it was to charge my Tesla compared to other vehicles. I think, you know, that is, that is a big challenge. I think, I think you're right. And um, you in the you know, Q4 hopefully, now, are you? I mean, an Audi Q4, yeah, that's, that's kind of the car I use on a day to day. I still do have my Tesla, which I love. I love it. I've never found a car more exciting to drive. Uh, it's got the same car as yourself, um, a Tesla Model 3. Um, and it's exciting to drive. I absolutely love it. But I think the biggest challenge, you yeah, know, just echoing what you said, is, is, is the charging with the charging tariffs, charging rates, AC charging with people at home. Because um, yeah. if you are fully charging all the time on DC, on public networks, it, it, it can, like the reality of it is it, it can become expensive, um, yeah. which, which is a shame because I don't feel like it's regulated in the way that it, it should be. Sorry, I, I don't mean to take over. This is, this is not about me. No, no. It's about the passion is coming through. I completely agree with you, Albert. And, you know, you take, for example, a Tesla supercharger, which will charge you in money anything from 30p up to 50p, whereas... I charged, um, for some reason, I, I, uh, I plugged in my car to charge overnight and it didn't work and I had to use the public network and my Tesla charge wasn't on the on the route to where I was going. So I had to plug into a, uh, another fast charge network and it was about 85p. That's double. I think I probably yeah. know which brand that was because <laughs> I think they're the most expensive one and I've had conversations about, about their charging before. How can mm. you pay double on that network when the Tesla network is so much bigger and I'm paying yeah. double, like it's crazy. But I was going to say, going back to the AC charging at home, the tricky thing is there are a few solutions at the moment. There's lamppost charging. There's recently today it came out that, you know, those green boxes on the side of the road that the electric company yeah, saw that. use. Yeah, they're going to start using those for AC charging. There is um, connected curb. There's lots of these companies, but you are still paying around about 35p per kilowatt, which they say not taking into consideration the savings from servicing uh maintenance on an electric car and the longevity which i'll go to in a, uh in a second is it's still not too dissimilar in in cost until of course petrol diesel start going up again you know but there are these yep. things to be made on servicing on you know teslas they only recommend to you know like an mot pretty much every year whereas some dealers some manufacturers they recommend a service every year um so it depends on the brand and uh, obviously there's the longevity to think about. On that Saturday, yeah. uh, Saturday just gone, I went to go and see a chap who's got a 220,000 mile Tesla Model 3. It's the, it's the biggest yeah, mileage amazing. Tesla Model 3 in the country. Never had a new battery, never had new motors. Um, little plug there for my next episode, Charge Head to UK. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it just goes to show that, you know, this technology, uh, and the longevity of these cars and what you can save is is there so so you know there is a lot of fud fear uncertainty and doubt in the media but i think what you really need to do is, is speak to people that own evs don't speak to someone who's you know might have driven one once or twice you know, yeah speak to the owners yeah. and they'll give you you know some reality yeah there's a company that we work quite closely with actually and they did like a little bit of a survey to uh, all of their, all of the all of the people that, that lease vehicles with them, and eighty percent of those who had been in electric vehicles said they'd never go back. And I think that's quite a significant number. Um, they went into some of the details as mm. to why some of the people said that they would. I'd imagine some of that come down to the difficulties with AC charging at home. Um, but eighty percent is a huge number. And I think once you've been in those vehicles and you've driven those and you've actually experienced life in an electric vehicle, I genuinely wouldn't drive anything else. And I've driven into Europe driven all over the country. Like I wouldn't drive anything else by an electric vehicle. Um, and that's, there's a number of reasons for that. And some of that's, some of that safety elements of electric vehicles. Um, some of that yeah. is just the, the, the pure joy yeah. of driving it, the ease of driving, 
And you know what? I, I used to say this when I used to sell cars at Tesla. Well, if you don't have a driveway, you could never have had a petrol station on your driveway anyway. But you could never have a petrol pump yeah. on your driveway, but you can have a charger. You know, you if you turn up at night with 20 miles in your diesel car, you've got 20 miles in the morning. Turn up with 20 miles in your electric, you're fully charged in the morning. It's costing nine quid to fill it. So, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's super exciting. So, um, what on on that then? What would you what would be like a, advice you would give to someone who is thinking of purchasing an electric vehicle or a new owner of a vehicle? What would be like your advice um, for purchasing their first electric vehicle? Um, are we talking new or are we talking used? Uh, I reckon, I reckon maybe, maybe both one on both. Cause it's the reality is some people can't buy a new, brand new electric vehicle and they're, yep. they're looking <clears> used <throat> for their options. So okay. maybe for both, like what would your advice be? So I'll give you the example. So I want to change my wife's car, which it was a Tesla, but then I nicked it for work. So we put her into a, a petrol auto Mazda 10 plate, you know, 70,000 miles. And we want to change that to electric. So what I'm doing, uh, bearing in mind my background in the motor trade and my experience in buying used cars, is I'm not just looking at used cars because they're great value at the moment. You know, for £10,000, you can get a Honda Ionic, which is a great uh, car. It's got good range, DC fast charging, um, you know, range about 150 miles, one of those. You've got Kia, uh, Kia and Hyundai SUVs, which are good value, about 15 grand. You can even get a Tesla now, Model 3 for about you know, 19, 20 grand, short range and long range. Yeah. Um, so there's some great value there, depending on whether you want to use your savings or do higher purchase or PCP. But then again, because the market at the moment, you know, especially with new, um, there's a lot of deals out there. You know, I saw MG were pushing some strong deals, a local dealer, I just saw it in my socials today. So I think it, it depends, you know, whether you want to pay a monthly cost, whether you want to own at the end. Um, but I would say drive some cars. My preference, like yourself, Albert, would, based on the fact of the efficiency in terms of the tech, in terms of the performance, in terms of the charging network, is Tesla, of course. But, yeah. you know, there are some other really good cars out there. So, you know, have, have a look, have a drive. I know not everybody likes Tesla. You know, a perfect example would yeah, be yeah. my manager. My, my manager, when he first started at Vital, similar sort of time to me, he had ordered a Polestar. And he was like, yeah, I went for a pulse start. I'm not really into Teslas because they have that stigma about them, which I get, you know. And then he was borrowing a long range Tesla Model 3 uh, while his pulse star was going to arrive. After three weeks, he cancelled the pulse star. Yeah. Because <laughs> he knew, he knew you know what, the tech, the uh, supercharged network, because he does a lot of miles yeah. that it's going to look after him. And he, he's loved it. So it's yeah. just one of those things. I would say, bums in seats, you know, get driving them, see what you think. Yeah. I, I think that's a massive, massive key point. Drive the cars. I mean, this is the thing is when I say this to people all the time, when you're looking at badges, it's all well and good to look at badges when it's petrol and diesel cars, but when it's electrics, you're, you're in a different field. The badge, the badge hierarchy is completely different. You know, I've, I've had conversations mm. with people about, um, you know, the, the BMW i3, uh, sorry, the BMW X3 and the BMW i X3. I'm like, they look the same. They're not the same car. Like the badge, the badge thing is is no longer. It's different. Like most people, when you say MG, they wouldn't give it a second look in a petrol or diesel car. But the MG4 is an incredible, incredible electric car. So, yeah, I mean, drive the cars, experience the cars, and, and don't just buy <laughs> off the badge. I think that's a great a great point. And I say it to people all the time. Once you get into a Tesla you'll realize how much car you're getting for your money. There are other cars out there, don't get me wrong, but you get a lot, a lot of car for your money. Hmm. I think that's great advice. The, uh, funnily enough, the iX3 and the MG are both made in China. So, you know, a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the, yeah, a lot of the legacy electric cars, uh, you know, Polestar from Volvo, a lot of the, you know, even VAG Group, uh, you know, bought Xpeng, I'm sure a lot of their, Cars are going to start coming from China as well because they can make them at a, you know, ex, you know, price that is affordable for a lot of people. So, you know, don't think that yeah, okay, if you've got you're buying a BMW or what have you, you're necessarily buying a German car as such. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't be afraid of the Chinese car so much. But <clears throat> we all have our preferences. But like I said, best thing to do, go and drive them for as long as possible to really get a get a proper feel. Yeah, I think it's good advice. So it's just coming back to to charging, and kind of this is this is where it'd be really good to kind of get your 
not opinion, just to kind of get you to, you know, it's a world that you work in. We talk about charging a yeah. lot. And as I said earlier, people don't really know the difference between an AC charger and a DC charger. Um, what actually is an AC charger and what is a DC charger? Okay. What does that mean? If I'm looking to charge my car, like what, what, what is an AC charger and what is a DC charger? Okay. So bearing in mind, I'm not an electrician. I'm ex motor trade. So it'll be nice, nice, uh, I suppose, nice uh, example, but AC stands for alternating current and DC stands for direct current. AC current is what you have at home. So, you know, out of your plugs at home, that's, that's your AC charge, uh, AC power. DC is direct from the grid. So you tend to only have DC, uh, power if you've got a business and it's three phase. Um, what you'll find with, <clears throat> uh, charging, AC charging, you'll do at home and at certain locations. And DC is only really on rapid charge, which tends to be sort of 40, 50 kilowatts and higher. And the main difference here, and this is something that um, people need to be aware of, is your the charging of AC will really depend uh, on your car, will only really depend on your onboard charger <clears throat> because your, your car has batteries and those batteries need to be powered by DC. So you put, uh, you plug in your vehicle at home, AC charger, that AC charge goes into the vehicle and that vehicle goes in, uh, that power goes into the AC onboard charger and it converts it into DC, puts it into the battery. With DC charging, that goes directly into the battery. So it bypasses any onboard charge of the vehicle. Now, something to note here is most electric cars have a seven kilowatt or 11 kilowatt onboard charger. So quite a lot of the time people think, oh, there's a 22 kilowatt AC charger there. I'll plug in, I'll get 22 kilowatts charge. That isn't the case. There's only about five electric cars that have the capabilities of 22 kilowatt AC charging because their onboard charger is able to deliver that. But most vehicles, vans and cars are seven kilowatt and 11 kilowatt. Another thing to uh, take into consideration is with DC charging. Um, again, it depends on what your car can take. So the example, you know, the Tesla Model 3 that I've got, which is 2019 69 plate, that can take up to 250 kilowatts. In fact, I got 220 kilowatts the other day from a V4 Tesla charger, which is super quick charger. But cars like, I don't know, an ID3 or an ID, uh, ID Buzz, they can only take about 100, 110 kilowatts. So even if you turn up to a 200 kilowatt charger, the vehicle will max be only be able to do up to what the car is capable of, which in this case of the ID Buzz or the ID is going to be about 100, 110 uh, kilowatts. Now, another thing to take into consideration when we were talking about speed of charging before is it also, uh, the speed of the charge also is determined by the temperature of the battery and also the state of charge of the battery. So the reason I got such a fast charge on my Tesla the other day was because the battery was really, really low. It's about 10%. And also because the my Tesla had heated up the battery on the way to the charger because it knew I was going to that charger. So warm battery, low state of charge, really quick charging. Now, if you plugged in, excuse me, a any other electric car within reason, and it had, I don't know, a 60% or 70% state of charge and the battery was cold, you're not necessarily going to get the full charge in that car is capable of. Yeah. It depends on the charger because the charger, you know, there's is a minefield. You know, it really is. There's all these variables. It isn't as yeah. simple as petrol in, diesel in. There are all these things to take into consideration. So just to summarize, yeah. heat of the battery, um, the uh, state of charge of the battery, the car. So the limitations of the uh, what charge it can take, whether that's AC or DC. Um, and then the charger. So the charger might say, let's say a simple 
rapid charger in front of you, it might say 200 kilowatts. That might be the peak that that charger can deliver, but the continual power might actually only be 150. And then there's more to it than that. It depends on the ampage of cables because it could be a 200 kilowatt charger, but the amp of cables might be smaller than the power that can be delivered. So that will restrict the power. So ampage of cables, the charger, and the grid connection, you know, there might be a certain amount of power going to a rapid charging site. And that power, yeah. if there's a load of cars there, it could be shared among all the chargers. So that will reduce the power as well. So there's about five or six factors there that can determine how fast your vehicle charges. Uh, and, I, you know, that comes back down to the education piece, doesn't it? Because people go in and I've been in there. Um, I've been in lots of... You know, I used to be a store manager at Tesla, so I used to look after my own team. Mm -hmm. And um, I used to you know, I used to say to my team, it's really important that we give our customers all the facts because it isn't as easy as just going and putting petrol in. You've got to make sure they know about preconditioning and, you know, that, that what, what can be delivered. Because uh, a standard range Tesla uh, Model 3 can't deliver the same, same um, kilowatt hour charge as a long range. And you know what, if, if, you, if you just go from a standard, this is what the Model 3 can, can achieve, you're kind of confusing people. And that's where the frustration comes in. People come in and be like, my cars. And that's why, you know, when you sound about driving cars, going around and test driving different cars, we, you need to make sure you're actually looking at these things, how fast your car can charge. What's the yeah. maximum AC rate? What's the maximum DC rate? Because, you know, worst last thing you want to do is I've been told that down the road, there's a 400 kilowatt charger. And I'm going there and it's still taking me an hour and five minutes to charge my car. Well, your, your car's only got a maximum capacity of charging at a speed of 100 kilowatts or, or whatever it might be. Mm. You're not going to fully get that 400 kilowatts just because it says it there. So, I mean, that's, that's a big thing for me is education, which is another reason why I wanted to do videos like this. Because if people don't know, they just don't know. And I've turned up to an, a, a VW garage and I spoke to a guy about cars. And he was telling me that the car could do what it couldn't do. And it's, you know, the education, even in salespeople can really frustrate people. And it's just like, and he was even telling me that these cars, this was at the time before none of the network was open at Tesla. I was working for Tesla at the time. Um, and he was telling me that you could go and charge on the Tesla network. And I was like, you, you can't do that. <laughs> so, you know, there's lots of different, lots of different things out there. So I've gone off on a bit of a tangent. But never change. <laughs> they do never change. They just want the sale. They just want the commission. But, you know, that, that's my biggest gripe. My biggest frustration is that, education when it comes to charging is not there you mm. know because the charging no, absolutely. you can get about you can charge your car you can drive all over europe providing you know what your car's capable of capable of and what charging actually even what what does a kilowatt hour mean like what does all this stuff actually mean like people just don't know mm. and um it can really cause frustration and people saying you know electric cars aren't the future and you know they're just too slow to charge and you know i've, I've been on a tesla charger and I've had in 15 minutes, I got 167 miles of charge and providing that you, you did the right preconditioning and you did every, did the necessary steps, the car does the guesswork for you, does everything you need it to do. You've only got a route to go there. It's going to tell you where you need to charge, how long you need to charge for. And I don't mean to just advertise Tesla. I'm just a massive fan of Tesla, but it's providing you do the right things. Electric cars are so simple to use. I think the key thing here, Albert is, and I'll say this to everyone is the fact that there's EVs and then there's Tesla because they are so, you know, Tesla's the more yeah. convenient and that's what people want. They, you know, they're used to just putting in fuel when they want, you know, staying on the red light and, you know, uh, the fuel light. And, uh, cause we've, you know, we've all done it. Um, but that's what Tesla does. It does make it so much easier yeah. because it does it all yeah. for you. So there's less of the guesswork. Um, but yeah, just, just hasten to add the, the uh, car sales comment. I used to sell cars for many years, so uh, I know the crack. <laughs> yes yeah i mean we've all been there i used to sell cars and i'd say i'd say all sorts of stuff but you know what just one final question um for you then because you know i love that comment and i think we should use that as a quote there's there's teslas and then there's evs because I, I agree with you there really is teslas are far mm. more than just another car out there what's your opinion then just on that of you know there's lots of companies now you've got bp you've got asda who have just bought lots of units of tesla superchargers to go out yeah. and about what's what's what do, you, what do you make of that being you know being a company that sell chargers and do chargers what do you make of that sort of uh, competition out there as in tesla as a competitor in the charging market 
Yeah, just in terms of like Tesla are now selling their units because you know you've got companies who are now. I think they sold a hundred thousand units to BP in the states, and I think Te yeah. Asda have just bought a load in the UK. Yeah. Um, do you think that that will help, or do you think that that's kind of struggling to make companies? You know, because you know, being at the EV charge in London, like the EV show in London, I I, I couldn't believe how many charging manufacturers there were. Um, yeah. You've got to be really careful think, when you go out to, to look at what charges you're going to use and what companies you're going to use. No, absolutely. And this is why I'm really happy to work at Vital EV because we do so many different solutions. And the Tesla charger, it's great. It's quick. Um, you know, I'm sure that they can make it at a really good price because they've been making them for years. So I'm sure they've got a good margin on that, you know, um, and, and I'm sure that they can uh, sell them at a good price. However, with what we do in terms of solutions, we've got three different movable DC chargers, which a lot of people, they might not want to do all the groundwork. They might not uh, own the property uh, where they want to do the charging. So they want to be able to just plug a charger in and charge it swiftly. And we've got three different chargers that allow you to do that. So you can literally plug it into a 32 amp three phase connection or a 63 and charge up to 40 kilowatts. So we do three different charges like that, which Tesla don't do, which is great for us. And we sell lots of those. Um, we also do, we do a number of brands. We do uh, Kempow, we've done them since 2019 because we're no stranger to DC. We've been in the market for a long time and we're a trusted partner among many, many companies and organizations. Uh, we've got, uh, we've now brought on last year, Alpatronic, which is a really strong brand. You'll see a lot of those uh, chargers rebranded at MFG, BP Pulse, and a lot of other uh, charging sites. Uh, we also got Autel. Autel is a really good brand, really good value brand. Uh, people might know, know that brand from uh, uh, the uh, car uh, diagnostics equipment. So it's not just a Chinese flyby charger brand because there's a lot of that about at the moment, obviously. But Autel is a trusted brand. You know, we've got um, and we've got a new brand coming soon as well, which is, you know, going to go against the likes of the even more value charges out there. So the thing is with our solutions is we've got um, EV equipment for lots of different scenarios. I mean, we've we quote uh, marine uh, charging, so charging for boats, uh, pantograph. So the charges that come up and round for buses, uh, charging leads with reels. There's so many different solutions uh, that are needed in the new electric uh, world for transportation. But Tesla, you know, yes, for that that uh, element of charging, they've got a great product there. But I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, yes, you've got to be aware of these things and the competition, you can't be blase about it. Um, however, I'm confident that, you know, we, you know, we, we deliver solutions to lots of different uh, scenarios. So, you know, it's, um, I, I'm not worried. <laughs> it's, it's no, no, no forgive me. That that wasn't what I, wasn't what I meant by the question at all. Um, in terms of being, being I think I saw okay. your products at the EV show. We've had we've had conversations around around your products. I think such a unique thing, and I agree that you know companies where mm. they where they're not they're in there and it's immovable. And I could even see how someone like Tesla could have benefited whilst I was working there of having that because we stored cars. Oh, and, okay, and we, you know we had at different delivery sites and i think that that the product that you have is so unique and is so it can fit in so many we used to deliver cars from literally car parks and hundreds at a time and yeah to have well, yeah, that would be perfect. Movie, would yeah. Have been incredible because it wasn't yeah there was a shopping center it's blue water shopping center and like, all different shopping centers like trafford center in manchester and you know to have sort of product like that is, is incredible so yeah forgive me that wasn't wasn't what i meant uh at all no, no, um, it's, but it, it is a great, it is a great, those charges that we do, I mean, especially the Autel and the Kempower, I mean, it's, it's helped. I mean, I'll give you an example, Nottingham City Council, which is one of the councils that's one of the most far along in terms of the electric uh, transition. They've got half of their rubbish trucks are electric, 25 of them. They've got vehicle to load, vehicle to grid. So power going back into the grid and back again. They've got battery storage um, to store from the, uh, electric that they produce from their solar. And they started with a chem power movable charger supplied from us in 2019. It's a great starting point. Um, so yeah, but yeah, we're always happy to, you know, if anyone's got any questions or if anyone, um, you know, wants advice, then, um, more than happy to help in that, in that regard. Amazing. 
Well, Tim, I really appreciate you sp like spending the time, taking the time to come on and, and chat with yeah, me. Yeah, no worries. Um, and you know, the main thing, as I said, was just for just to chat with you around the EV charging and just to give a bit more insight and education for people just on what that space actually looks like and what it means to be involved in EV charging because it's uh, as you said, it's a minefield. It's a uh, so there's a lot, a lot to it. It's a, it's a big, it's a big world, and um, it's a big part, of, part of EVs, and it's a big concern for people as well. So yeah, really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your time, and um, I'm sure we'll catch up soon. No, for sure. Thanks, Albert. Thanks for having me on. Cheers. Thanks so much.